Good morning. It's my privilege to attend this important conference. And just I was very humbled listening to Mark talking about the leadership role that the foundation has played for the last uh, quarter of a century. So today I'd like to share with you some of my recent work on cell-free DNA, especially how we can identify new classes of such markers. So this is my declaration of uh, interest. So for the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of uh, intense global interest in the development and the use of cell-free DNA in different body fluids, such as plasma, for a variety of molecular diagnostic purposes. And two areas particularly emerge. One is the development of non-invasive prenatal testing, or NIPT for short, and the second is a cancer liquid biopsy. Now, the first generation of this sort of cell-free DNA markers, or CFDNA, are generally based on genetic markers, so such as detecting the SNP allele differences between the fetus and mother and mutations in cancer. But over the last few years, there's been more interest in the development of what I call non-genetic cell-free DNA markers. Now, for example, the best known of this is those based on epigenetics, such as DNA methylation. Now, for example, in 2013, we developed a genome-wide approach to actually look for uh, cancer-specific uh, methylation markers across the genome, and we showed that using one blood test, you can develop, detect multiple types of cancer. And then also because different tissues in our body have got different DNA methylation profiles. By using this approach, you can also localize the tissue of origin of a particular cancer. So these technologies have now basically been underpinning technology of the GRAIL gallery test, which is now undergoing trial in the NHS here. But one problem about this sort of um, epigenetic test so far is that most people would have to convert an epigenetic phenomenon into a genetic one, which is then interrogated by DNA sequencing. And one of the most popular of this sort of conversion process is that using a chemical called sodium bisulfite. But the problem is that every time you do that, that is a chance that you degrade a significant proportion of DNA. I mean, some literature even said that you might degrade 90% of your input DNA. So because of this reason, we and others have been very interested to look at non bisulfite based method, which allow us to interrogate the epigenome. So today, I'm going to share a number of those efforts with you. And then more recently, people have also looked at the fragmentation of the cell-free DNA. Now, because if we're looking at DNA molecules inside cells, it is chromosome length. But on the other hand, if we look at cell-free DNA in our plasma, there's generally approximately 160 base pair or so in length. So the question is, what is governing that fragmentation? And then, actually, we and others have shown that this sort of fragmentation are very powerful classes of markers. Now, for example, in the bottom here, you can see that one of the earliest type of fragmentation markers is that based on DNA sizes. Now, for example, we know that circling fetal DNA and circling tumor DNA is a little bit shorter than that of a background hematopoietic DNA in our blood. And then in the top left-hand corner, um, because many of this fragmentation is uh, mediated by nucleases, which have nucleotide sequence preference. So we and others have also shown that by looking at the N nucleotide sequence, we call them N motifs, we can also increase the specificity of this type of assay. And then on the right-hand side, we also know that some of those nucleases, when they cut, they have a preponderance of creating jagged ends or blunt ends. So that's yet another type of fragmentomics marker. And then also more recently, we have found that actually the circling DNA, in addition to linear molecules, which is mostly studied in literature, there are also molecules which are circular. And this is particularly important in the study of circulating mitochondrial DNA and circulating extrachromosomal circular DNA. Now, what is not so known about the field is how these various type of non-genetic markers interact with each other. So today, I'll spend a lot of time talking about the interactions between fragmentomics and DNA methylation. Now, as I mentioned just now, a lot of this of fragmentation is mediated by enzymes like nucleases. So one very powerful method to try to study this is to create knockout mouse model 
in which selected nuclease genes are knocked out. And then we try to see what happens to the circulating DNA profiles. Now, for example, if you look at a wild-type mouse in which all the nuclease genes are intact, and then you look at a certain DNA and you measure the level, this is what you get. You find that it's generally hypermethylated because most of the CPG site across the genome is methylated. But when you knock out a certain nuclease gene, like DNAs1, then you see basically nothing has changed. But on the other hand, if you're lucky, if you hit out the right nuclease, such as this nuclease called DNAs1 like 3, some people also call this DNAs gamma. It's a nuclease which actually cut chromatin. And intriguingly, circulating DNA is basically circulating chromatin. If you knock out this gene, then you find that you start to see those hypomethylated fragments appearing in the plasma, the red dots. Now, if you do some bioinformatics and you mask out all the open chromatin region and the CPJ island, then you find that all this aberration is gone. So indicating those are the origin of those hypomethylated fragments. But of course, if I show you data like that, then you will say, well, is that because if you knock out this nuclease, somehow it affects the constitutional methylation status of the mouse genome. But we find that it's not the case. For example, you look at the, the, the blood cells of those mice, you basically see, for example, in the middle there, there's no difference in the methylation level on the constitution of the, of the genome. What we're seeing here, the aberration, is confined to the circulating DNA in plasma. So we published this work at the end of 2021 saying that nuclease efficiency will somehow affect the circulating DNA profile. And of course you would say, well, what is the implication of that? So at that time, we thought that the implication of that would be very straightforward. It just means that if you have individuals with DNAs 1 like 3 deficiency, such as people with familial systemic lupus erythematosus, then if you do certain cancer liquid biopsy tests, you have false positive results. So we think that is a valid conclusion, but on the other hand, in terms of public health impact, they're probably not huge, because there's only very few people, actually, with those sort of deficiencies. So after thinking about it for a while, and doing some soul searching, then we think actually the way to ask the question is to look at it in the opposite direction. And that is to ask, can fragmentomic profile in blood be used to deduce the methylation status of DNA? Now, to do that, you need to do a deep dive into how the nucleus actually cleave methylated and unmethylated DNA. So here in the bottom here, at position zero, we'll put the, CP, the C at that position. So C, and then the position one is where the G is. Then you can find that if you have, so if you have, if you look at the red line, which is actually from a methylated DNA, then you can see there's a very sharp peak. So in other words, if the DNA is methylated, somehow the nucleus would like to cut exactly the position of the C. But if you go to a minus one position, then the probability of cutting drops tremendously. But next, we move to the blue line, which is if your DNA is unmethylated, then you see that position zero and minus one. Basically, it's not a dramatic difference in those two. So for this, then we think that we can develop this concept, which are called FRAGMA, which stands for fragmentomics based methylation analysis. You have to see how we can deduce methylation status based on how it is fragmented. Now, for example, if you look at this um, C position on the methylated side, if you imagine if the, the molecular diseases and nucleus cut at a C, then that circling DNA molecule will end with CGN. But on the other hand, if the nucleus cut in a minus one position, then the DNA molecule will end with NCG. So what it means is that you can actually have this ratio, which is CGN divided by NCG. So on the left-hand side, if the DNA is methylated, then the CGN is increased, and the NCG is decreased. But on the right-hand side, if the DNA is unmethylated, then CGN is decreased, and NCG is increased. So basically, you have a ratio. We can differentiate the two types of DNA. So now it's, it's just like this. If you look in the human plasma and you take out all the methylated CPG sites on the left-hand side, then you can see the CGN divided by NCG ratio is approximately 4.7. 
On the right hand side, if you look at the unmethylated CPG site, then it's just over one. Now, and then we can actually look across the whole genome or look at selected genomic elements. Say on the left hand side, we use the gold standard, which is bisulfide DNA sequencing. You can see that across the whole genome, about 75% or so of the CPG site are methylated. And you look at the ALU regions. And on the right hand side, if you look at the genes, the, the CPG island, then the methylation level is very low. But now on the right hand side, when you see a fragma, it means basically with fragma technology, I can replicate what you see with B sulfide sequencing, except I don't need to do all that uh, uh, method. Now, another class of genomic element which will be very useful to see if fragma works is to look at genomic imprinting. So these are genomic elements which are differentially methylated, depends on the sex of the parents in which we inherit it from. Now, for example, one of those uh, locus is GNAS. So on the left hand side, you can see that for this particular individual, the A allele is associated with methylation, which is a black dot. And the G allele below is associated with hypomethylation, the white dot. So on the right hand side, you can see that the CGN and NCG ratio of the A alleles and the G are basically completely opposite direction. So once again, indicating a fragma concept actually works. So the next question is that we want to know why does this fragma work? So what we did is that we actually look at individuals who are healthy uh, controls, plus in the bottom here are individuals who have homozygous mutation in the DNA's one like three gene. So those are individuals with familial SLE I've been alluding to. You can see that once you get rid of the DNA's one like three gene, basically this fragma doesn't work anymore. So in other words, this nucleus is crucial for the operation of fragma. And then we wonder, can we use fragma to detect cancer? So we start with looking at hepatocellular cancer. So here we look at perform fragma analysis in the ALU repeats across the whole genome. So indicate on the y-axis. And on the x-axis here, we actually use more conventional method, looking at copy number aberration in the plasma. So you can see that clearly this fragma signal correlates with the copy number aberration signal. And then also when we split the liver cancer according to Barcelona staging to different stages to early, intermediate, and late, then you can basically see there's a gradual change in fragma signal as the cancer progresses. So next, we then, in, in addition to actually just looking at this ratio, we think that we can further refine it. For example, we can actually train a support vector machine model by using various types of CGN motif in the circling DNA, which are basically eight different types. So in other words, you can see those uh, nucleotides there. So we can have either CG for the first two, and then it can be ACTG for the third position, or for the last four, is that we have CG at the second and third position, and then I can have ACTG in the first position. And then I ask this support vector machine to differentiate cancer versus non-cancer. So you can see on the left here, we can basically separate the cancer and non-cancer group very well. And on the right-hand side, the area in the curve is actually 0 0.98. And this is actually better than some of the first-generation motif uh, method that I developed back in 2020, in which the area in the curve is only 0.86. And then apart from liver cancer, we also look at a hand neck cancer called nasopharyngeal cancer, which is very common in the southern part of China. So this cancer has a very interesting feature. It is associated with Epstein-Barr virus infection. So previously, we have developed a plasma EBV uh, DNA PCR to try to screen for this cancer. So we did this in a pilot study of 20,000 people. And so what we do is that we take two blood samples, separate by four weeks. If both samples are positive for EBV DNA by PCR, then we'll go for endoscopy and imaging. And then we find on the left-hand side, basically, with this technology, without screening, then actually most of the uh, cancer in Hong Kong is discovered in stage three and four, which is, um, but on the other hand, on the right-hand side, if you use this of screening in plasma, then we can shift the stage so that 70% is in stage one and stage two. And because you're getting the cancer, you're identifying cancer so early, so in the top line here, then the survival has improved tremendously. In the bottom line, is people without screening, that over long term, some 40% of them die. 
So this work was uh, published in 2017, in which we uh, have a positive predicted value of 11%. So for the last few years, we've been very keen to see how I can further improve the positive predicted value further. So we thought one way to do that is to say, in people with cancer versus those without cancer, if I can find a EVDN in plasma, is there any quantitative or qualitative characteristics which are different? So we do a capture sequencing of those uh, individuals, and we find that generally people with the cancer have a high level of certain EVDNA than people without cancer. And also more interestingly, we also look at the fragmentomics of the EVDN in plasma. You can see on the left-hand side here, in patient with uh, nasopharyngeal cancer, the NPC fragment size is just a little bit shorter, about 20 base pairs shorter than the background constitutional DNA, and very similar to what we find previously with fetus. But on the right-hand side, this is a false positive result, somebody without the nasopharyngeal cancer, but who, for some reason, also have the virus DNA in blood. You can see the level is different. So basically, by combining this of um, circling DNA concentration plus this fragmentomics, I can push the positive predictive value to 19%, from 11 to 19%. And I can get that with a single blood test. So now you can plot that further. So the x-axis is the fragmentomics, the size. The y-axis is the concentration. You can see the cancer groups basically uh, gravitate to the top left-hand quadrant. But now, by using Fragma, I find that I can further split the, the left-hand quadrant into two groups. And in so doing, I can push the PPV to now to over 27%. Now, as I mentioned just now, for this sort of multi-cancer screening test, one element you need to do is to be able to tell where is the origin of that cancer. So we're also interested to see whether fragment analysis will allow us to attribute the origin of circling DNA. So we actually start by using a liver transplantation model in which we can genotype the donor and recipient and look for circling DNA of different SNP genotype. So if it's from the donor, then we know it is actually coming from the liver. So by doing that, I can actually look for liver-specific methylation. So here in this graph, I look at those loci which are hypermethylated in the liver. And then I can plot out the donor-derived DNA in the plasma versus the shared DNA, so they share the same SNP allele, so they're mainly basically hematopoietic DNA from the recipient. So you can see that the FRAGMA profile is different, and from this profile, I can deduce what is the concentration of the donor DNA in blood. And that is important clinically because the concentrated donor DNA will shoot up if you have rejection episode. In the bottom here is I reverse now. This time I look at liver-specific hypomethylated uh, 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 sites. And this time you can see the, the relative position of the red and blue lines are reversed. But once again, I can also measure how much liver DNA I have in the blood. And then we will also try FRAGMA for NIPT for the fetus, which previously we have shown that the fetal DNA maternal plasma is coming from the placenta. So you can see that in this case, we look at placenta-specific hypermethylated sites. And once again, using that, I can deduce how much placenta DNA we have in the circulation. And then as a control, we also look at hypermethylated CPG site. And once again, I can do the same thing. So now up to this point, you can see basically FRAGMA basically works. And the advantage of FRAGMA, it allows you to access methylation information without actually having to do a special pipeline to it. So, so any of you who has done NIPT, for example, or cancer liquid biopsy, if you use a random sequencing approach, you actually already have a methylation profile in your data. So that's the attractiveness. And also the development of FRAGMA also tells us that it's worth investing to understand the basic biology of fragmentomics. So the question now is how can I push forward the uh, knowledge in that area? Is there any way we can actually discover previously unknown mechanism of CT, CFDNA fragmentation? So recently I've been exploring with this approach called non-negative matrix factorization, or NMF for short. Basically it's trying to deconvolute a matrix into its various components. This is a technology which was previously used a lot in audio engineering, in which we're trying to have a sound source and we try to uh, separate into components. It's almost like you have a color light and I go through a prism and the prism will tell us what are the component color. 
So what I want to know is what is the various component which contribute towards a fragmentation profile in the blood. So basically we start off with a population of mice of different genotypes, either wild type or mice in which different nuclease genes have been knocked out. And then we look at the circulating DNA, we look at the fragmentation profile by profiling the end of those molecules, the end motif. And then we go through this NNF algorithm. And interesting, we're able to find six different types of profile. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can see that they have different emphasis of different types of ends in the molecules. And then we can also use this in the plasma and in urine. Now, when you look at the plasma and urine, one of the things that you can see is that in urine, they have a lot of this um, uh, yellow signal. And yellow signal is coming from profile two. And then interesting, if you look on the right-hand side, that in the, in the right-hand side uh, most, if you knock out DNA one gene, then suddenly all this yellow signal is gone. So in our words, the conclusion is that yellow signal, profile two, is associated with DNA one. And then on the left-hand side, is in blood, you can see that in a wild type, which is WT, you see a lot of that red signal. And red signal is profile one. But now, if you knock out the DNA one like three gene, which is the, 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 the left uh, over there, and that red signal is gone. So now it's indicating that the red signal profile one is associated with DNA one like three. So it's just like that, you just basically like a detective story go through. For example, this is F profile one, the one like three signal, when, when you see there's a lot of DNA molecules ending in C in there. And normally, in a healthy uh, mice, a wild type mice, about 34% of the circling DNA is caused by profile one. But now, if you knock out that DNA is one like three gene, then you drop to single digit percentage. So we go through that systematically, and then we can basically fill in the puzzle. So one is caused by one L3, two is caused by DNA one, three is caused by this uh, nuclease called DNA fragmentation factor beta. But the interesting thing here is that four, five, six, we have no idea what it's caused by. And that's perhaps a good thing, uh, interesting thing about that because they'll keep me employed for the next few years. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now, of course, we're curious to, so like we have a new toy and now I want to play with the toy. So the first thing we did is try to see uh, what happens to those profiles in cancer. And then you can see that actually by looking at the con uh, proportion of those different profiles, I can have some differentiation in cancer types. Especially for liver cancer, profile six seems to be performing very well with an area under curve of 0.97. And furthermore, when you move from control to hepatitis B carrier to liver cancer, that's an increased contribution of this profile six. So we decided to, to take a look, more look at this profile six. So we look at colorectal cancer patient without metastasis, liver metastasis, and with liver metastasis, you can see that it gradually increases as well. So somehow, intriguingly, this profile is increased if you have cancer, and furthermore, as the cancer progresses. So we take a look at this more detailedly. So just now, when I show you profile one, or most of the other profile, usually one of those color will predominant. But in profile six, it's very strange. It seems that it's not very discriminant on the different types of DNA ends. As I mentioned to you before, from, at least from the experience I have now, if it's a nucleus, and usually they have certain uh, DNA sequence preference, but this phenomenon doesn't have that. So I was wondering, maybe it's not enzymatic. Maybe it's associated with some sort of physical process, like oxidative stress or radiation. So in that regard, actually, we looked at a cohort nasopharyngeal cancer patient before and after chemoradiotherapy. You can see generally that after this chemoradiotherapy, there's an increase in profile six. So generally, it's increased from a median of around 6% to just over 10%. So clearly, I think it's something worth investigating. So actually, this work has just been published today, actually, in PNAS. So which is very good timing. So it's an auspicious day. <laughs> OK, so up to now, I hope I've convinced you that it's worthwhile looking at these fragmentation patterns. And also, it's a dogma in the field that uh, the circling DNA we're looking at are short fragments of DNA, as I mentioned to you just now. But recently, I'm starting to have another sort of soul searching. I wonder, is that true or not? Right? Because it's always good to be a skeptic, okay? and, and, and I'm really very skeptical. It's almost like on a sunny day like this, 
you wear a blue sunglass. And of course, you look out, everything is blue, right? So, so I'm thinking, well, if everybody's using Illumina sequencer to look at circling DNA, and Illumina sequencer is a short resequencer, then of course, everything you see is short, right? So I wonder <coughs> what would happen if you use some of the more latest generation of single molecule sequencer, like that from PacBio, Pacific Bioscience, would you be able to see some longer DNA in plasma? So I have a student and I ask her to do this. Now, this is what happens if you use Illumina sequencer. <coughs> Most of the signal you get is 160 base pair, and you virtually don't see anything, you know, above 500. But interestingly, when you look at Pacific Bioscience sequencer, then suddenly for the first time, we see there's a generate, a population of extremely long cell free DNA, which was previously undetected. And then you can see when we, in pregnant plasma, as you progress in gestational age, those long DNA get, get more and more. And actually, they are quite significant. For example, in the first trimester, we're talking about a median of 15% of those DNA are long. In the second trimester, 20%, and third trimester, 30%. So that's amazing. We know for the last 25 years, we're just wasting all those molecules, not ex interrogating them. And then, of course, you say, well, what is the advantage of having long molecules? One advantage, of course, is it's genetically more informative because we have one SNP every 1,000 base pair. So if your molecule is 160, then you need several of those to give you one chance of having a SNP. But now you have a super long molecule. One molecule is enough to give me maybe a whole haplotype. Now, for example, indeed, this is one of those super long molecules we see in maternal plasma, which is 16 kilobase, which is un amazing. So with that one molecule, I can work out the whole maternal, uh, that inherited haplotype of the baby. But previously, on the right-hand side with Illumina sequencing, you need to do a lot of bioinformatics to try to deduce what that fetal molecule might look like. And this is another a maternal molecule, this one even longer, 24,000 ba uh, base pair. And then one molecule, you can have whole maternal haplotype. And also, because it's so long, that we can probably also use a methylation profile to try to tell where is this molecule coming from. Uh, so previously, in 2015, we developed this technology called plasma DNA tissue mapping. This is basically the technology that we now use to allocate the tissue of origin in the, in the GRAIL test. So in which, basically, we look at the plasma DNA and then compare with epigenetic profile of different organs, I can work out what are the contribution from different tissues. But of course, the problem of this of technology, as I mentioned, is that most people use bisulfide conversion, which is a very nasty chemical. And now, if it's a degradative process, if you have long molecules, then you might very fragment it. So it's not a good idea to use that sort of process to try to study the super long molecule in plasma. So I'm wondering, is it possible that I can develop a better method, a direct method. So I'm thinking, well, then, if you have this single molecule sequencer, you're sequencing a DNA, you don't have to do PCR, because the PCR will already will lose your methylation profile. But with single molecule sequencing, then I won't. Is it possible that the methylation profile is already somewhere in the sequencing trace? Only that we don't know. It's almost like you're driving a car, and then you see an obstacle, and then you slow down your car, and when you arrive at the obstacle, you steer past the obstacle, and then you speed off away. So even without seeing the obstacle myself, just by looking at the trajectory of the car, I can predict there's an obstacle there. So in other words, by looking at sequencing trace, the kinetics, maybe I can deduce there is a methylation profile there. So we developed this technology I call the holistic kinetic model, HK model. It's also, of course, named after my, uh, my city, Hong Kong, right? <laughs> So I was thinking that when the polymerase is copying on the DNA molecule, I record all this thing into this table here. It looks very complicated, but no need to go into detail. And then because the DNA is double-stranded, and I make it in a circle, so I also have some data on the other side, and then I combine the two tables together. And then when I was looking at a table like that, I thought that it looks like some sort of a, almost like a picture, right? And then we wonder, can I use some of the machine learning system now, which are trained to study pictures, like the convolutional neural network? So maybe inside that picture, we already got a methylation level. I mean, it looks like a crazy idea, but nonetheless, we just tried that. So I train the machine, and then I validate that and see what happens. And of course, to train, 
you need to have some sort of a gold standard. So I artificially methylate some DNA, and then artificially do the PCR so, so that the methylation signal is gone, and I train in it, and I'm using different generation of the PAC bio reagent kit. And surprisingly, you can see it works very well. The area on the curve is like 0.97. And then, reassuringly, even in the validation data set, it basically holds true. Okay, so that, but of course, that is very artificially methylated and unmethylated DNA. Then you say, what about clinical samples? So we actually put in some placenta, some liver cancer tissues, adjacent normal liver, blood cells, and even a cell line. And then on the uh, x-axis is a gold standard, the cell phase sequencing. And y-axis is this HK model. You can see they correlate very well, 0 0.99 correlation. And then when we do a deep dive into it, we have this series of circles plots. The inner ring is the HK model, outer ring is bisulfide sequencing, and then you look at the color. So different color represent different methylation level. So generally, you can see that it, it really correlates extremely well. And then at this level, the correlation coefficient range from 0 0.85 to 0.98. So basically, it works. And it looks like this method is very direct and intuitive. Now, for example, if you use Illumina sequencing, look at this region, chromosome 1, the Illumina sequencer will only give you a series of very short reads, and it will tell you a little bit of methylation status on the left is hypermethylated, and on the right-hand side is hypomethylated. But now with the HK model, I can have a long read, which can span across the whole, whole region. And also, previously, when you used bisulfide sequencing, let's say you got a sequence like that, you see a T, right? And when you see a T, Without looking at reference human genome, you have no idea is the reference human genome a T or whether it was originally an unmethylated C, which then converted into a T by your bisulfide process. <coughs> but now with, a, with the HK model, I can directly read that, and I notice unmethylated C. And then in the middle here, this is a methylated C, et cetera. Very direct and intuitive. So this work was uh, just published in 2021, and I see that some individuals can already replicate the data so now we want to see whether this HK model will also work in plasma DNA. So we use a maternal plasma as a model. We sequence by pack bio sequencing and go through HK model to elucidate the methylation status. And then we also have a whole group of reference methylomes from different tissues. And I'm trying to look at methylation profile, which matches that from the placenta. And you can see that because the molecules are very long, they have more CPG sites. It's almost like you have barcode which is longer, and of course you are more discriminatory and specific. You can see with this longer uh, molecules, above 600 with a red line, I have a better area on the curve than a shorter molecule. And we think, well, if it's so long and I have all this information, maybe I can use it for some sort of NIPT, just an example. Like for example, here we have the father and mother in the genomic region in which there's a gene on the right-hand side, which is related to a single gene disorder and then I can take the maternal plasma, do this long sequencing. The paternal inheritance is easy. I just look at SNP to find SNP allele, which is uh, unique to the father, but absent the mother. Then I can also use this methylation status to find things which are of placental origin to elucidate maternal inheritance. And then we decide to actually try it out on, say, fragile eggs. So if this family, in which the mother is a fragile eggs pre-mutation carrier, and they have one previous baby with fragile X, so the mother's pregnant again, and she would like to know the risk of the new baby. So by using this uh, long DNA, and I can actually uh, use a methylation to trace where it's coming from the baby, I basically know that mother have two X chromosomes. Denoted here is a blue one, in which the premutation is there, and, uh, and a yellow one, in which is no premutation. And now, by using this system, I can basically tell the babe deduce the baby has this X chromosome in which uh, uh, he hasn't inherited the premutation. Okay, and, and then of course in, in the long run, I think this, pro this technology still need a lot of work, but it's very exciting because previously for single gene NIPT, perhaps one of the gold standard method is this method called relative haplotype dosage analysis that um, uh, Dame Lynchity has done a lot of work on. But this particular technology requires a, lo a, a lot of sequencing. 
Now, for example, previously when we used this process, we find that we need hundreds of millions of reads. But now, with the super long cell-free DNA, I can basically crack it with approximately 30 million reads. And then we've also been looking at the implication of this super long DNA for pregnancy and social disorder like preeclampsia, or PET for short. Now, for example, we find that in PET individual, there is basically a reduction in the amount of super long DNA in maternal plasma. And for example, there's a summary here in which you can see there's a drop in that level. But interestingly, you cannot actually see that with Illumina sequencing. The reason is because the denominator has changed. The denominator has to involve the whole spectrum of CFDNA of different lengths. So you can only do it with single molecule sequencing. And then, of course, we wonder if this uh, super long DNA is present in pregnancy, does it present in cancer? So we find that it does. Actually, for example, this is a group of uh, people with liver cancer. You can see that, once again, it's very similar to that we see in pregnancy. And then even the super long DNA contains also mutations. And then, of course, uh, many of you do single molecule sequencing, but using nanopore. And of course, you wonder, can I see those with nanopore? So the answer is yes. For example, here's using Oxford nanopore. You can also see those super long DNA. And those are the fractional concentration. But very interestingly, but somehow the actual amount of the relative concentration of the super long DNA is higher when you do a pack bio system compared with nanopore system. But if you're looking at the absolute read number, the nanopore has some advantage. So I think more work still needs to be done about the relative merits of different of those platforms in this uh, population of DNA. So I think the impact of this super long DNA would be like this. For the last 25 years, when we're looking at the short snippets of DNA, it's like I'm texting you. I can text you 20, 30 words. But now with the long, super long self-free DNA for the first time, I send you a whole word document for you to study. So I believe actually this very long self-free DNA diagnostics and direct methylation analysis will allow us to see details which we cannot see before. So I think we'll have a lot of research and diagnostic potential. So in summary, hope I've convinced you that um, it's worthwhile looking at those new generation of non-genetic uh, cell-free DNA markers, particularly those from epigenetics, fragmentomics, and topologics. And also talk about this intriguing interaction between epigenetics and fragmentomics, which has resulted in the discovery of this uh, fragma uh, concept. And then we also talk about, if you want to push this further, you can use a deconvolution analysis, which may allow you to discover new mechanism of fragmentation. And also finally talk about this recent uh, discovery of the super long self regaining using single molecule sequencing and about how to interrogate those by direct methylation analysis. So finally, I'd like to thank individuals from my group for generating the data which I present to you today. And thank you very much for your time.